We're going to have Jim Ross on the line in just a couple of minutes, and we'll start taking uh, phone calls. We'll go through as many emails as we can. We probably have enough emails to go through about three shows, I think, for Jim Ross. Uh, Brian, um, I was going to ask you a question. Here, this, this, um, I spent like all day the last couple of days like uh, figuring out like awards and things like that. And next Friday, which we don't have a guest next Friday, uh, we should do the award show. We'll go through all the Wrestling Observer Awards. So we'll do that a week from today. But um, this will give away the result of one of the awards, I guess. Um, it is the first time in history that the winner of the Rookie of the Year Award was fired by the company before the year was over. Oh, no. so anyway, yeah, can you believe that? How about that? How about that? Not only that, he probably had the best match you've seen in how many years in your, right live? Live? Yeah. Uh, maybe ever. <laughs> oh, my God. Brian, what else is what else, I've been I've been like uh, let's see what else has been going on? Anything else big going on today? Well, there was a big article in the newspaper about Steve Austin getting his surgery moved to January 17th. It'll be at the Methodist Hospital in San Antonio with Dr. Lloyd Youngblood, and apparently it was a case of the hospital being closer to his house, and he didn't want to have to fly all the way out to Dr. Bullman to get checkups and everything like that, and. Um, I would assume, you know, after the surgery was over, trying to get back to San Antonio and that sort of thing. So, anyway, it has been moved. It'll be January 17th. And I believe there was also a quote from Dr. Bullman wondering why Austin had changed the date of the surgery since he was the man who invented the procedure. That's, it's, that's really interesting because, you know, uh, Dr. Bullman had come so heavily recommended by Dr. Torg. And uh, the procedure, you know, um, like he invented the procedure and he was the one... You know, the whole thing is, is you know, he wanted to get back like Cal Ripken. Anyway, when Jim Ross is here, we'll, uh, we should talk to him about that one. Uh, that's uh, kind of an interesting thing. I, I had heard about, I had, had heard that report. And also uh, yesterday, actually, uh, speaking of the San Antonio area, Cameron Cade Hickenbottom was born, Shawn Michaels' son. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Now get him back to work. Yeah. Okay. He was born yesterday. I did not. That one I didn't hear. Oh. What, what, uh, anything else going on? We can uh, start hitting emails before we get Actually, to Actually, here's the one to ask Jim Ross, because it, it was in his Ross report that just came out today. Oh, the, the Terry Funk thing? Oh, that's a classic. Yeah, Terry we... Uh, still under contract to the World Wrestling Federation. Yeah, we've gotten like uh, 400 emails on that one, so we'll talk... Actually, that'll be like one of the first questions we talk to him about. Uh, when we get him on. Also, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, I believe, today did a story that's actually, it actually was, the first I read was in the Pro Wrestling Torch about uh, a week ago about the WWS television contracts revolving uh, UPN and uh, and also uh, USA Network. And we want to get uh, want to get some comments on that as well. Because, uh, I don't know, just kind of interesting. Uh, you, you know, SmackDown is generally credited in the media for um, saving UPN from basically. Out of ex- going out of extinction and being buried under a sea of incredible red ink, and if that was the case, and UPN had had you know given the WF this network deal and everything like that, wouldn't you think they would retain an option to not lose it if the show was a hit? I would think. I mean, so. I don't know. I don't know. I would just think that. So anyway, it's something that maybe they were probably... so desperate they just gave the WWF anything they wanted. Um, perhaps, perhaps that's that's really interesting though. Anyway, let's get to some emails for the next few minutes. This is from Andrew Martelli who said that you mentioned that Vader's the best worker of over 300 pounds. That's true, but I think a close second goes to Glenn Jacobs. Um, after all his cheesy gimmicks, he only found the right one, but now the WF's killing his gimmick. Okay, I think Kane has improved a lot. I mean, really, and he's, his matches are, are a lot better than they were a year ago. But uh, I don't know if it's close second between Kane and Bruiser Brody. I don't think he's in that league, personally. Uh, this is from Ben Lid. Um, if the brawl for all was to set up Steve Williams to walk away, then how can you explain Dan Severn being in the tournament? Um, I don't know. How would you explain that one? I don't think that. Well, that's a good question, actually, because it's a real good question, isn't it? Maybe they, because you know, Dan Severn, of course, would just take everybody down and take downs for what, like five points or something? Yeah, I, I think that the feeling probably was because uh, you know originally they didn't want uh, Dan Severn or Ken Shamrock in it. Okay. Then about a week or two in, some of the guys started dropping out. I'm not sure exactly what went down. And then um, they asked Shamrock and Severn to do it, and Shamrock said no. He didn't want to just go in there with no training, you know, and do a shoot. And Severn said yes. And then Severn did one match with the Godfather where he took him down, which was – actually, that match was, like, hilarious. You, you remember that match, Brian, don't you? The Dan Severn match. The Dan Severn-Godfather match where he just kept taking him down over and over again? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
No, but what's funny is he would take him down, okay? And then every time he took him down, Godfather would, like, go to the guard, okay? But in wrestling, like, in theory, okay, if you're in, you know, it was supposed to be wrestling takedowns and judges wrestling takedowns. And what would happen is Severin would take the guy down and then Godfather would go to the guard. Now, when you're in the guard, in a martial arts sense, it's considered a neutral position. But in a wrestling sense, you're on your back getting pinned, but pins didn't count. Yeah. But it, but it was takedowns. And I just remember, like, uh, Jerry Lawler going, well, that's not a takedown. And, like, he would just take him down, and then Jerry Lawler would go, well, that's not, I don't consider that a takedown. And I was just thinking, like, you know, thank God that they have Danny Hodge scoring this, because this announcer is calling this match. You know, I, Jerry Lawler um, it was pretty much exposed that he had never actually watched wrestling in his life. Uh. And and uh, because he kept saying how Dan Severn never scored any takedowns, when all he did was keep taking the guy down. But I think that the theory behind it, perhaps, um, was one of two things. Either, one, they didn't really think about it a lot, or, B, the feeling was that uh, Dan Severin, um, that, that Steve Williams would be a good enough wrestler that Dan Severin wouldn't be able to take him down, and that if the match remained on its feet, that Steve Williams would probably be better standing than Dan Severin. And so maybe maybe that was the theory behind it. But um, Well, that's the only theory it, that makes sense other than that they weren't thinking. Yeah. So, anyway, actually, let's throw that one in the list of questions to ask. Too. Ask Ross. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Joe Rivette who says, worst entrance music ever, Steve Regal's Man's Man. Now, see, I like that one. Oh, I'm that sorry. was a good one. <laughs> yeah. That was a classic. Yeah, that one was just too good. Uh, let's see, uh, let's go to one more because we've got Jim Ross on the line. Uh, let me see, this is, um, uh, da, 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 da. why doesn't WC, this is from Alfredo, Alfredo Esparza, he goes, why doesn't WCW tape Nitro? I'm serious. Watch Nitro and Thunder at the same time, and it looks like night and day. Well, the last couple of weeks it has, hasn't it? Hey, i got a question for you. Yeah. Why couldn't they have taped Canyon hitting Bigelow with a barbecue or his uh, champagne bottle at Nitro instead of flying him all the way in for 13 seconds? Because um, I, I think they weren't thinking that far ahead. Let's ask you know, like, about I, that one, too. Uh, Jim, it's like, yeah, ask Jim Ross about things in WCW like that. You He'd know? have a good answer, though. He probably will. Let's get him on the line. Jim, how you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? Hey. We're doing really good. Jim, this is uh, Brian Alvarez. He does Figure Four Weekly. And uh, we've got, I don't know if you've heard this, but we have more fax questions or email questions than any guest that we have ever had by far. And we had, you know, we had a lot from Ric Flair, too. But this is, I got like a, like a week's worth of emails right in front of me. Um, and also, you can call up on this line at 1-877-392-3200 for Jim Ross. We'd want to keep the callers quick because we expect to get a lot of calls today. Jim, how's the week been going? Uh, good. You know, busy, as usual, but uh, doing well. I think, uh, like, not unlike anybody, uh, a lot of other folks, I'm trying to personally uh, combat the flu I've had for a couple of weeks. Uh, so much for the concept of getting a flu shot early. But other than that, things are things are good. You know, uh, on the personal side, things are good. My my oldest daughter just got accepted to graduate school, and you know, I think that's a pretty cool accomplishment for her. And uh, she has uh, worked very hard to be a good student. It hasn't come real easily for her, so she's worked very diligently and going to continue to get educated, which I think is a good thing. Are there a lot of guys, uh, you know, was battling the flu right now in the company? Because I know in the Northeast, it just seems like, uh, from what I hear, it's it's like it's almost epidemic. We have uh, a lot of our talent are have a variety of ailments, and the flu certainly seems to have affected uh, more than its share on our roster. I think uh, it's really uh, seemingly taken its toll on a lot of the folks who work up here in the office because, like you said, the Northeast seems to be has to been hit uh, especially hard. So, uh, but we're working through it. You know, uh, just we can keep on going. So. That's is there right. anyone? Uh, is there anyone who's going to be missing this weekend because of uh, injuries or illness or anything? Uh, we're going to let D.O. Brown have a couple more days off to get over his uh, shoulder injury. Uh, uh, as a precautionary thing, he could work this weekend. We think it'd be uh, better for him, and certainly uh, in the long run, to let that, his shoulder heal another couple of days. And uh, he'll be back uh, Monday if needed for uh, for Raw. But D.O. will not make the house shows this weekend. Uh, Bulldog was originally booked on these cards. Uh, I talked to some folks in Calgary today. He'll be clear to come back to work uh, as it stands right now on uh, January the 17th, which would be the Raw in New Haven. So he will not be on the cards this weekend. Uh, hopefully, if we've done our job, he would have been removed from the advertising earlier. 
but in any event, uh, he will not be on the card this weekend. I can't think of anybody else off the top of my head. You know, talking to you guys might jar my memory, but uh, I heard Rodney might have hurt his shoulder at the SmackDown tapings. Rodney Rodney dinged his shoulder a little bit. He did, uh, and uh, even though Rodney's not booked on the house show tour this weekend, uh, he's going to uh, has trained through that injury, from what I understand, and uh, according to our I have a guy by the name of Bob Clark who works for us in uh, talent relations. That is uh, one of his jobs is to be the point man on all the injuries and the rehab and stuff. And he's been staying pretty busy on that project. And he told me today that Rodney's uh, shoulder was sore, but he'd be ready to go on Monday. What about um, um, Ken Shamrock and Mark Henry? Well, Ken Shamrock, interesting thing there. Uh, Kenny was cleared from his neck condition to come back to work probably two or three weeks ago. Uh, and then about a week ago, uh, we heard on the Internet that he had knee surgery, which was news to us. Uh, we called him, and he flatly denied that he had not had the surgery. Uh, then, subsequently to that, uh, Vince and I met with uh, Ken in, in Stanford about a week or so ago. Uh, he looked great and declared to come back to work and, you know, great frame of mind and looked well-rested and so forth. And uh, then I talked to Barry Bloom today, uh, Ken's agent, about some other issues, and uh, he mentioned to me that Kenny had had his knee scoped this week uh, on a little minor thing, according to uh, uh, Barry. So uh, just some, I guess, some loose particles that they made a small incision and got out of there. Not a big deal at all from what I understand, and uh, probably uh, maybe a week's worth of uh, therapy to get him, you know, to work the soreness out. Not a major thing at all. But uh, Mark Henry has got a slight uh, ligament tear in his elbow, that uh, we're trying to rehab through and not go the surger, surgical route. And Mark uh, hopefully will be back uh, in time for some participation from the fiscal level at the Royal Rumble. Now, what about uh, we, I guess, heard a report that Austin is uh, switched to surgery to San Antonio January 17th. Uh, what do you know about that? Well, Steve uh, had uh, consulted a doctor down in uh, San Antonio and uh, uh, regarding his neck. Uh, after he had seen uh, Dr. Torg and Dr. Uh, uh, Bauman and uh, got a, built a rapport with the guy, and the doctor was a, spe was a specialist in these sort of injuries, was a surgeon, uh, had performed uh, uh, these type of surgeries that Dr. Bauman, quite frankly, had uh, pioneered. This guy had, had uh, performed several of those surgeries as well. And uh, this, he developed, a, Steve got very comfortable with him. The fact that it would be done there in San Antonio, <coughs> pardon me, uh, uh, was a, another benefit. And uh, they're putting together a real uh, A-team uh, of physicians. And uh, this doctor has taken a very special interest in Steve. And Steve was a little bit uncomfortable with uh, the publicity surrounding uh, his uh, involvement in Cleveland, I think. Uh, uh, you know, the, the minute he walked out the door, it was on their website. Yeah. And it's just something that, uh, you know, we'd like to not be that aggressive on. It's, uh, uh, I don't know, we just, it was a little bit, we were a little bit, a little bit surprised that, that they were that uh, proactive, shall we say. But bottom line is that Steve feels very comfortable with these surgeons in Texas that have looked at all of his files, have spent hours and hours consulting him. Uh, they've spent more time with him on an individual basis than any doctors that he's ever had. And he's gotten very comfortable with them, and something surgery, surgery of this nature, uh, that's a very important aspect of, uh, uh, of the procedure, is him being comfortable and confident that he's in good hands. And he feels very comfortable and very confident that these folks can do, the good, do a good job. So uh, basically, it's been scheduled for January 17th, and that's, that's uh, as it stands now. Uh, it's exactly when that will happen, and he's been training almost every day. Uh, I talked to him uh, just a day or two ago, and his his spirits are better than I've talked with him in, uh, I don't know, months. He's just uh, really happy about this decision. He's looking forward to the surgery. Uh, he's excited about the future. And uh, and so, uh, to me, it was uh, it's a it's a good thing, you know. If, uh, uh, but apparently, uh, the clinic in Cleveland has, has issued a press release uh, where Dr. Bauman thinks Steve is... Uh, either somewhat naive or not very bright to allow someone else to operate on him in the world other than Dr. Bauman. And, you know, oh. Dr. Bauman's opinion.
Has Steve given any indication that if everything goes well, he'd be willing to do something in the ring for WrestleMania? No, we haven't talked about uh, WrestleMania. We haven't talked about any any events. Uh, we're taking everything uh, a day at a time uh, in a literal sense. You know, the main thing is to get him ready for the surgery, and, boy, he's doing everything he can to do that. That's what we're focusing on right now. And then the 17th, uh, we're going to keep our fingers crossed that the surgery comes out as well as we expect it to. And then we'll kind of go from there and see how his rehab goes and so forth. I think it would be unfair to Steve. I think it would be unfair to the other guys. I think it would be unfair to the company, fans, anybody associated with our product, to go ahead and kind of pencil him in for WrestleMania right now, uh, even though we feel like the, the chances of him being able to do something uh, in the ring uh, after his surgery uh, are better than they've ever been uh, since his condition arose. Yeah. Now, now, does this, has this doctor offered any differing opinion as far as, like, uh, um, his, you know, the, the chances of him uh, being able to wrestle full time, part time. No, um, no, everybody's everybody's opinion is basically the same. They they all believe that they can put him back into normal physical condition, that he can lead a normal life. As we all know, what these what these uh, athletes do, these performers do, is not normal. Uh, so, how Steve's body's going to respond to the bumps of, of working uh, remain to be seen. The doctors feel like he's got a heck of a good chance to come back. Uh, he thinks he's got a heck of a good chance to come back. I think he certainly believes that he has not had his last match. Now, obviously, uh, if, if he were able to come back, would, would, we, would, we would book him in, in a very judicious sense, like you would any commodity, and uh, to make sure that, uh, that we didn't uh, over, you know, overdo it. But, you know, we're basically just taking it one day at a time. I think it's just... It's just hard to, to, to plan on what you would do with a guy until you know that you have the availability of him. And it's easy uh, when you have an Austin that's like, like you're bringing back, you know, uh, uh, he, he's, he has been, and in my eyes, is still the top guy in this business. Uh, and until uh, he is permanently uh, taken out of uniform and sitting on the sidelines, I, he's going to be that until someone, until Austin can't defend his place. Uh, and I, I just think that it's easy to get him back involved as over as he is uh, if we see that he could physically be able to do a few things. But, yeah. you know, there's no hurry. We think what, we're comfortable with where we're going to WrestleMania, and having Steve Austin as a part of it obviously would be a huge boost. No doubt about it. I'm not trying to downplay that. But he is so over that if we didn't know we weren't going to have Steve until a week before the event, we could figure out something very quickly uh, that, that, Steve, that Stone Cold could be a part of at WrestleMania. I think any of us could probably do that. Uh, what's Really quickly, what's the doctor's name in San Antonio? Youngblood. Dr. Youngblood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you know the fir Brian, do you know the first name by any chance? I think you mentioned it to me. Yeah, it's... Uh... I think it's Lloyd. Yeah, Lloyd. This morning I've been out there cracking the numbers as far as uh, the Wrestling Observer Awards. Uh, Jim Ross was named for the eighth time uh, Wrestling Announcer of the Year in our uh, readership poll, and he got he got more votes in his category than anyone except for the guy who won Best Box Office Draw, which I'm sure is not a stretch to figure out who that happened to be. So anyway, just wanted to congratulate you for that, Jim. Oh, thanks, Dave. That's, that's very nice. That's uh, you know, no matter what uh, folks may uh, think, that's always been a real. Uh, um, a nice thing for me. I've always been. It's always been a great motivating factor, uh, uh, and it's very, very nice, and it's very flattering that uh, the fans that study the, the business as closely as they do uh, think favorably of my work, and it's, uh, I appreciate that very much. And I think uh, the other guy, uh, uh, you know, I got no problem with those numbers. He pretty well uh, blew everything <laughs> box office away that there ever was. Like I say, I want to sound flippant about Steve's return. You know, our biggest priority is getting Steve healthy so he can just lead a normal life. Uh, if we get him back in the ring, that's going to be a huge bonus for us. And, you know, when you got Stone Cold uh, available, uh, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be a booking genius to figure out that you're going to get him involved in whatever event he can be involved in. Uh, and it's not too hard to do with him being so over. Now, one thing that we saw, I guess it was, uh, in, I think it was in the Atlanta paper this morning, and I know it has been uh, circulating uh, here 
uh, for about a week. Um, the story about uh, the contract with USA Network and UPN, is, is, is that actually uh, expiring soon? And talks I don't, about you know, going... I, I've, I've, I've read a little bit about that, and, and I'm not directly involved in, the, uh, in that area. Uh, and uh, I'm not, I don't think that those contracts are up like uh, imminently. But I do think that uh, they may be uh, getting ready to start their negotiations for the next run. Uh, that I could that I could uh, uh, feel comfortable saying, uh, out of, you know, knowing. But I don't think that, the, from what I understand, that they're upright, you know, like imminently. Uh, and of course, both USA were the highest rated shows on both networks. So uh, I don't think that uh, um, there's going to be uh, certainly any issues as far as the network. And, uh, wanting to keep uh, its respective WWF programs on the air, uh, so I really know where I don't really know where we are on that. Other than uh, I know both networks are very pleased with the results that we've been getting. Uh, did you did you um, hear anything as far as the thing that happened on that uh, radio show yesterday with The Rock? And what, what did what did you hear about that? You know, that's uh, I, the only thing I really heard about it was it, it seemed like. Uh, from the information that I got, that Rock was kind of ambushed in that interview, and uh, the host of the show uh, are saying that they, from what I understand, saying that they weren't aware of what was going to happen, and the guy that did the uh, the ab- 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 abrasive material, kind of a John Rocker type thing, uh, very racial, from what I gather, uh, and I didn't hear the show. Uh, he then basically uh, shifted the blame to his writers for posting something that uh, he wasn't aware of. So everybody really started passing the buck, and and basically uh, The Rock was offended by the nature of the, the, the dialogue and uh, politely excused himself uh, as they went to commercial break, or during the commercial break, left. So uh, I think he handled it as, as well as one could expecting to under the circumstances and I'm sure that those guys that they had the opportunity would, would might, might want to reconsider their reconsider their creative on that segment but uh, that's what I understand about it it was just some some racial remarks that he was particularly offended by and, and, and declined to participate any farther in the program I assume you've read uh, rocks autobiography by now right I've read uh, a large portion of it. I have not finished it yet. I actually only got the book on Monday in my hands, and uh, I didn't get to start on it until the plane on the plane ride back on Wednesday. So uh, between uh, blowing my nose and and uh, taking vitamin C and stuff, I have read uh, uh, a great deal of it, but not all of it. Because I got a uh, book review here. Somebody emailed me that's read the entire book, and I guess there's a lot of information in the book. Or he talks a lot about how strongly he is against racism and actually tells a bunch of stories about how at different times during his life when he's, I guess, been confronted with people that have said things that he has gone as far as to attempt to strangle them and pull the tongue out of a teammate's mouth during a fight. So obviously it's something that he's very uh, concerned about and um, – I don't know, from, from what I've heard, because I actually went up to the website and I read some of the stuff up there, and obviously uh, there is a lot of, uh, I, I don't know if I would say uh, hate would be the best, because what they try and say up there is that it, it's in parody, and obviously that means nothing. But uh, anyway, apparently uh, it was not um, Sick Boy, the individual that was on the show, that actually posted the statement. But Rock had a good point in that he said that if you're the webmaster of this website, you should probably know what everybody else is putting on there as opposed to coming on here and saying you know nothing about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he's very sensitive about those issues, as he should be. And uh, I just think that it was, it was uh, a, a, bad, a bad decision made on the radio people's part, uh, you know, and, and not that we all in the creative vein haven't made bad decisions on, on programming. Uh, yeah. You know, so I think uh, they made a mistake, and, and he decided to not participate any longer. And, I, and, and you know, we, I thought that he handled it when I heard how it was handled. I thought he handled it really uh, very with a lot of class. He didn't yeah, I mean, he didn't explode or anything like that. He no. basically no. stated his point and then left. Exactly. Uh, you posted something uh, today. In fact, you've gotten a lot of uh, emails about this one, and this is the thing in regards to Terry Funk's contract with the WWF. 
um, and his appearance with the WCW. Um, what's basically that all about? Well, um, Terry's contract uh, rolled over at the end of December, and it had an automatic uh, option year on it. And uh, quite frankly, uh, Terry had been getting royalties, you know, for his work here on tapes, videotapes, and and uh, merchandise items, uh, primarily videotapes. But he'll still get a quarterly check for his royalties. And, uh, you know, we have a great relationship with Terry, and, and I think uh, that's the basis of the fact that even though he, he participated on WCW's program last week, under contract to the WWF, uh, we're choosing uh, to release him of his contract so that he can pursue their opportunity. Uh, and certainly we'll look forward at some point in time and, and uh, to doing business with Terry again. You know, we have a great deal of respect for Terry Funk, and, and you know, we didn't have anything creatively for Terry at this point in time. Uh, so he had an opportunity to do something that he, he wanted to do, apparently. And uh, so we just weren't going to stand in his way. And so it was, a, it was a, just a, you know, kind of slip through the cracks on uh, our legal people's side, that the contract expired, or rolled over rather, and I'm sure that uh, Terry hadn't thought another thing about it. Obviously, he didn't. Uh, probably wasn't even aware of it. It's my point. So uh, we're looking at it as, a, as if it was an oversight. And uh, Vince, I know, has a great deal of respect for Terry, uh, and I certainly have been a fan of his uh, for years. I mean, uh, for a long, long time. I think the world of him. So you know, it's just one of those things where we're going to. He'll sign a release, hopefully, the next day or so, uh, and then uh, that will legally, uh, you know, make it, uh, you know, make it okay from a legal standpoint for him to continue doing what he's doing. So uh, he has all that paperwork, and I'm sure he'll be getting that taken care of, and, you know, we'll move on to better business. Um, we have a question here from Tim Knoll who's asking, uh, is a reckless youth under contract and if so, are there any plans for him? And also, when does Amy Dumas start? Well, right now, Amy Dumas is, uh, her creative is under, uh, is being addressed. Uh, we, there's a good opportunity that we may put her with Poppy Chulo and give them a, a makeover and repackage them, so to speak, and see what, uh, and see how that looks, you know, and, and uh, we'll see how they how they function in the ring. We're going to bring them up here to Stanford and spend a week or so with them and see uh, how what kind of chemistry they may or may not have. The nice thing about it is, is that we're encouraging Poppy to speak English more, and, and Amy can help us there because she speaks Spanish. Uh, so we're going to look at that, and I would suspect that they would probably uh, would they debut. I'd say within the next four or six weeks. Um, it may be sooner, but that's a pretty safe window. Um, and what was the other question? Uh, is Reckless Youth under contract? Yes, he is. And uh, we're looking at uh, um, assigning all of our con all of our developmental uh, people will, within the next 30 days, all be working either in Louisville or Memphis or Puerto Rico. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure exactly where this young man is going to go. Uh, Bruce Pritchard is the point person on the new talent development program, and uh, we haven't sat down uh, and talked about where he would go. My gut would tell me he'd probably go to Louisville. How about Scott Vick? Scott Vick is uh, ready to roll. He's in great shape, and he's healthy, and uh, we're going to bring him up here uh, next Thursday for three or four days of uh, – Kind of, I don't want to, uh, n not really an evaluation, but basically just an assessment, and uh, watch him work in the ring, and watch him, and uh, listen to him do some promos, and uh, uh, basically learn a little bit more about him, uh, so that we can uh, get some feedback from some folks within the company as as a, as uh, it relates to his character development. So he'll be coming up here next week, and. Uh, uh, again, based on what creative direction he goes, he should also be another one that would, would see starting in the next four to six weeks. So that's starting in the WWF and not going anywhere else? I think, I think uh, it, it, our, our opinion right now is that his working ability, he could probably start here with us. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, if not, his assignment in one of those other areas would prob- probably be for, you know, uh, two to three months. Yeah. Now, I saw something that uh, Jerry Lawler was getting TV in Memphis. Mm-hmm. Um, What's is there? What's is there like any kind of a thing going on between you know because you got you guys are sending the talent to uh, Randy Hales in Memphis, and of course Lawler works obviously with WWF and um, I mean what's the company's stance on that? Well, we, you know obviously have a great rapport with the King and and uh, and uh, we have uh, a good rapport I would say uh, with uh, Randy Hales uh, basically because of uh, Jim Cornette's efforts down there in Memphis on our behalf. Um, the uh, we are uh, as I have said on my website and uh, the last 30 days, easily 30 days, that we're going to be making some major changes in our talent development program uh, this year. And our goal is to basically give that whole department uh, of, of talent relations, that whole you know area of talent relations, a, a makeover. Uh, and there's certain things that I want to that department to do as far as being able to uh, more accurately measure uh, and evaluate talent, uh, a more aggressive uh, method of scouting and recruiting, uh, and then consequently signing uh, good human beings that have the uh, uh, some aptitude and obviously some athleticism and some hopefully some charisma that we could mold into a player for uh, uh, the WWF roster. Uh, there's just a lot. I wanted to. I wanted to to really be a state of the art program. It isn't right now, and uh, hopefully within the next 60 days we'll see some huge changes in that. And that may be. Uh, that may mean some changes in uh, in Memphis. Uh, it could be some subtle changes in Louisville. Uh, certainly, we're looking to start something in Puerto Rico. Um, so you know, there's. I'm looking for a lot of changes there. But we we don't see right now any uh, issues, uh, any 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 significant conflict of interest, uh, as it would seem on paper with Lawler doing a show, and then us doing the uh, been working with Power Pro. Uh, you know, King wants to get more exposure in Memphis, and he works two days a week for us. So, you know, and I, I can understand his motivation. So, we're supportive of his his product and. Uh, we're going to, as we are all of our talent development areas, uh, continue to evaluate uh, our relationship there with Randy Hales. Okay, I want to do one more, and then uh, we'll go to a break, and then uh, go to the phone calls. This is from Mike Hall, who is uh, from Oklahoma, and he just wants to know, in your opinion, uh, who was the best wrestler ever to come out of Oklahoma? Oh, God, that's a loaded question, huh? Yeah. Might as well ask me if I'm a Mickey Mantle fan. <laughs> Uh, well, that's obviously, to my view, Danny Hodge. Uh, you know, if you're looking for amateur wrestling, it's no, there's no question. Yeah. Uh, there's other pros that drew more money. I mean, Watts drew more money than Danny Hodge. I mean, Watts drew big money in New York, and Watts drew big money in Frisco and other places. Uh, and Watts drew more money in that territory than Danny did. Uh, there's some contributing factors to that, ticket price, et cetera, et cetera. The Cowboy actually orchestrated and drew more money on top. Uh, but Hodge, I believe, was the best uh, the best I ever saw. I mean, it was him. He had, and I would think, quite frankly, the second best I ever saw out of Oklahoma would be Jack Briscoe. Yeah. And Briscoe was a great amateur, too, but he probably was not quite as good an amateur as Hodge. hope Jack doesn't beat me up for saying that. But Jack had more charisma and probably was a better pro than Hodge. He was more, more. Uh, he was definitely a bigger star worldwide than Hodge. Hodge was more. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, not that Hodge wasn't a big star, you know, and, and a star where, wherever he went, but but Briscoe in the early '70s was, you know, the number one or two guy probably in the whole business for a yeah, while there. And the thing about that is that, you know, the, the fellow asked me my my favorite, and again as a kid and watching wrestling every Saturday night at 10:30, you know, uh, Hodge was the number one baby face in the territory and he was the Oklahoma hero and you know and he it was a special there was a special bond with a, a real Oklahoma guy on this you know fighting all these Japanese guys and these Russian guys and you know all the stereotypical uh, 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 heels that he uh, was was booked with so I think 
you know, my favorite was Hodge, and that's from sentimental reasons from a business standpoint. Briscoe was probably the better pro. And also he wants to know if uh, WWF has got any plans for a television taping in Oklahoma this year. Well, you know, I love you for that all the time. I had a conversation with Ed Cohen about that today. We were talking about WrestleMania in the year 2001. And uh, I said, well, I guess that means Tulsa's out of the running. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I pretty well got that verified. Uh, <laughs> on a serious note, I, I, I think that there is a chance we might be able to do something in Oklahoma City uh, if it will route with, uh, it, uh, when it would route with either Little Rock, who has a brand new building, 18,000 seater, and or uh, Dallas. Uh, but it's going to have to route. And uh, right now it's not scheduled. But I, I hope, and uh, you know, I'm continuing to do a little bit of hometown lobbying that we have uh, at least one event there uh, in uh, next year in Mecca to TV taping. Any news okay. on Seattle? Uh, yeah, Seattle. We're going to do a TV taping in Seattle uh, this year. Uh, I can probably look at my book and tell you when you come back from the break. But I think it's in April. It's going to be tied to Vancouver. Vancouver for Monday Night Raw and then uh, Seattle for uh, SmackDown, I believe. Let's go to Kevin in California. You're first up with Jim Ross. Hello, Brian. Hello, Dave. Hello, Jim. How are you? I'm oh, good, thanks. Hey, congratulations on your daughter. Oh, thank you. My 11-year-old son, Tyler, is your number one fan here in Stockton, California. Just want you to know that. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, he was pretty upset when the other company ran the Oklahoma gag. Mm -hmm. I told him that uh, while it showed they had no class, that it was a backhanded compliment, that they're obviously jealous of your stature and your talent. What could I tell him from the horse's mouth uh, your feeling was about that? Oh, I'd tell him not to take it too seriously. That they're uh, those fellows are just trying, I guess, uh, create a character that would be entertaining. But uh, you know, I didn't ever think it was too entertaining uh, from a personal standpoint. Uh, but not take it too seriously. You know, uh, it didn't bother me as much as uh, as uh, some folks thought it did. Uh, you know, it wasn't something that I hung my hat on. No pun intended. Just uh, gotcha. you know, it's just you got to be bigger than uh, than than some of those situations that you're faced with sometimes, and then. And uh, just and move on, and that's you know. That's what I'll uh, tell them. One other quick question: Brian and Dave have told me I'm crazy, but could you ever see a scenario, for the sake of the fans, where the companies would get together for a once a year extravaganza pay per view, and we could really see a knockdown drag out? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's a simple answer. You're right, Brian. You're right, Dave. Hey, thank you for giving me the time. You bet. Okay, uh, so our, our next excuse me, so our next caller, uh, Pat in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, doing, excellent Pat? show, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Ross, I just, uh, I know this is a rather broad question, but um, just wondering if you had any fond, well, what, what are your fondest memories of uh, working with Cowboy Bill Watts and Mid South Wrestling? Well, I think uh, some of the best memories of working with Cowboy was, was uh, uh, watching him write, uh, which at times was some extremely entertaining, episodic uh, weekly television. Uh, uh, it was amazing to see how he would forward the stories uh, and uh, where all seven segments of a one-hour show would have some significance. Uh, there'd be very little throwaways where you get somebody the obligatory win because when you, just when you thought that was going to happen, uh, something, big, something big exploded, you know. Uh, so I think watching him write episodic TV uh, and keep storylines fresh with a shorter roster than uh, than uh, folks are using uh, nowadays uh, was 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 extremely uh, uh, educational for me. Um, you know, he his uh, long term planning uh, and his his uh, method for making house shows special. I certainly used a lot of those principles in booking our house shows for the last uh, few years, where you try to make the show special and just not have a bunch of matches for matches' sake. So uh, I think both the, the, his, his orchestration and, uh, and management of a house show card and his ability to write episodic TV, uh, compelling episodic TV more often than not, with a short roster was, uh, uh, was some really uh, uh, memorable stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, given the, uh, the climate, the atmosphere of the business today, do you, how, how successful do you think he'd be if, if he attempted to... Uh, get back in the business today? Well, if you didn't have to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship with a talent, 
uh, there's a lot of things Bill could do now in a, an administrative capacity that, no doubt in my mind, he couldn't contribute significantly to any company that does wrestling. Uh, but uh, Bill, by his own admission, uh, doesn't have a lot of patience in uh, in dealing with people uh, in this field. Uh, you know, I think in other areas he's he's done better. Uh, but uh, Bill has some, some there's some challenging times. Uh, we have some challenging times and motivating talent in the way that he's comfortable doing, mm-hmm. and that's through power and through intimidation. And uh, I don't think that philosophy works anymore. And personally, you know, in, in my view, and, and I think that would be his, his challenge. Mm-hmm. But he's he's a brilliant guy. I mean, you know, he had a great mind for the business, and I'm sure if he were so motivated, he was he, he could do it again. But his personal skills in dealing with the talent in this era of talent, uh, I don't think would be as positive as uh, you would need for it to be. Yeah, I mean that's uh, watching a tape of the uh, the Doug and DiBiase coal miner uh, cage match, coal miner gloves. Oh, Houston, I mean, Texas. Just, nothing like that. That it's just hair. It puts uh, the goosebumps on your arms. Yeah, well, he had a great uh, ability of capturing the drama, and you got to remember that not only did he orchestrate those matches and, and create those storylines, but he laid, by and large, laid all the spots out. And then he would, then in turn, because of his passion and his vision, would tell me uh, at a certain point there when I started doing it, the story behind the match. And to go out there and be passionate and to tell a story. And I never had any problem being passionate because uh, I was a huge fan. I mean, that was a I, mean, I, I was pinching myself because I'm a big, this huge wrestling fan, this little Oklahoma town, actually getting the opportunity to do commentary for wrestling. And God, I was the luckiest guy in the, in the country, and I still feel that way by and large. So right. I, I uh, he had a, it, it was amazing to look back at it because it, it was a lot of a one-man effort. Uh, by, even though he had a lot of bookers, he still put his fingerprints all over the product, just like Vince is doing. I had a question about the WWF booking. How long-term are you guys booking now? Because I know Vince Russo said before he left that it got to the point where he was writing TV week to week. And now that they're gone, have you guys gone back to more of a long-term, uh, I guess, plan for the main events and some of the undercard, or is it back to, I guess, just a couple of weeks in advance? We're doing more long-term planning now than we were uh, a few months ago. And uh, uh, I think... Uh, I think uh, that's basically because Vince is it's his, it's his basic primary responsibility now to write the TVs. Uh, he's trying to plan farther ahead uh, because, quite frankly, it makes it easier. Uh, if you know your destination, you can create your you know your journey is established. But you got to know where you're headed. You got to know what road to take. And if you don't, you just travel. Where are you going? I mean, where does this journey take you? Now, do you do long-term got, we, planning with uh, all the programs? Because I know one of the main problems would be if somebody got injured, obviously some plans would have to be scrapped. So is it mostly the important storylines and the you know the lesser storylines from the undercard are more? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, I think it's been that way in the business for years. The, the primary, the main events, the box office, as they call it, gets the most of the focus and the most time devoted to it as it relates to uh, the storyline and airtime, uh, and the, the others are given less time simply because there's not more time available. Uh, and, you know, uh, so I don't think that's changed any. But I do think, you know, we have a pretty good feel of what uh, several things that we, we, we would like to do at WrestleMania, uh, and, you know, it, kind of depending on how stories develop and talent develops and, and things of that nature uh, uh, happen, and, the, you know, the nature takes its course. You know, we we have a fairly good plan of where we'd like to go at WrestleMania. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, um, pa- Poppy Chulo and um, Amy Dumas. Are there any are there any people, like say in the next four six weeks, maybe people in in Louisville or, or Memphis in particular who you're you're looking at bringing in or close, you know, who would be like the next rung of developmental people that are are close to to getting on on TV? Well, we've got about <clears throat> we've probably got uh, half a dozen people that we think are close to being ready. Uh, and we are uh, in the process. Uh, uh, this week there's been a lot of, uh, uh, we've looked at a lot of tapes. And I think, uh, I would think probably we're going to have a little bit better feel for that uh, within the next week. But we know we think Steve Bradley's about ready. 
you know, we we like uh, what uh, Jim Cornette has done with Barry Buchanan down in uh, Louisville. We have an idea, maybe for a character for him that would uh, uh, that would work. Uh, Steve Bradley's work has been uh, at our TVs. We can look at him every Monday and Tuesday. Uh, has been excellent, and he's a fine young man, and, and he's uh, you know a real uh, uh, welcome addition in our locker room. And and one of the way, one of the reasons that we bring these young guys when we're getting close to doing something with them to TV while they're working in other territories so they can build the relationships with the guys that are already here. And, uh, you know, Steve Bradley's not unlike Kurt Angle. Uh, Steve Bradley had less obstacles to overcome getting accepted in the locker room than Kurt did because Kurt came in, you know, as the Olympic gold medal winner, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Kurt has, has uh, been accepted, you know, very genuinely and very warmly in the locker room. He's a hardworking guy, a humble kid, and, as uh, you know, he's turned into a, uh, we, what we think right now is we're, we're static with his progress and where he's headed. But we think Steve Bradley's about ready. You know, we think Barry Buchanan is sure getting closer, closer than he's been. But I, the other issue about that is we're going to spot some guys, like I said, maybe five, six guys that we think are close, but they still have obligations in their territories they're in, and they're in programs, they're in issues. And uh, in all fairness uh, to uh, Jim Cornette, we're not going to take any talent. Uh, from him without uh, him being totally aware of it and, and on the same page as it relates to him finishing up that talent. That wouldn't be fair to them. That would defeat the purpose of trying to work with those uh, with those guys down in uh, Louisville and Memphis or wherever it may be. Do you guys ever be concerned with all the developmental talent that you'll actually get eventually two people to do anything with? No, you say that again? Um, as far as, like, the new developmental talent, do you guys ever get, um, I guess, think about what would happen if down the road there was, there was so much new talent in the company that you just didn't have enough, I guess, spots for them? No, oh, that's a good problem to have. I, I hope we can encounter that problem sometime, and maybe I'll call you and ask you for your advice on how to solve it. <laughs> I honestly don't know. I, we've never been in that position, Brian. I, I honestly, we've, uh, there's never been too much talent, and when you're doing, you know, uh, as much TV as we are, uh, you know, we're a long way away, in our view, from being uh, in, in that predicament. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I don't know that, you know, we're going to sign a whole lot more prospects than are going to make it. But that's no, not unlike a kid going to Hollywood wanting to be an actor uh, or a or guy signing a, uh, a rookie contract with a baseball team. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have a whole lot more prospects than you're going to have keepers. Yeah, and, I was uh, just looking back at, like, you know, World Championship Wrestling when they probably had 120 guys in their contract, and there were so many talented guys, and they just didn't have a role for them, and so many of them floundered. And, I mean, I was just wondering if there was any, you know, how would that be handled if such a situation arose? Well, it, it, is, it, it would be a predicament, and certainly the uh, territories that we were working with would be uh, have the opportunity to have some, some, uh, some better workers uh, available to them. Uh, but you know, I, I still think that we're we're a lot of we're several steps away from having that problem. Let's go to Dave in New York right now. Dave, what's going on? Uh, hey, one very quick question that I guess either of you could probably answer, and then my question uh, for Jr. is that my first question is: Is the IWA Puerto Rico starting? Uh, excuse me, IWA Puerto Rico TV starting tomorrow on Telemundo because that's what their website says, but TV Guide says that infomercials are on. I, I wouldn't know the answer to that, but I will. I think Victor Quinones has uh, been talking to them about doing a deal. Uh, I, I don't know how close it was. Maybe it's maybe that is the situation. But there's been some dialogue. You know, Victor's a very uh, ambitious guy, and uh, has survived his whole career in making deals. And uh, he's he's got some ideas and some stuff that he wants to do. And and quite frankly, he's got some pretty good plans. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they're paying for the time. It might be listed as an infomercial the first couple of weeks. Hmm. I wouldn't think I wouldn't think he'd be paying for the time. I don't think so. Yeah, that wouldn't be you know I mean just just judging from what what he's wanting to accomplish. I don't I think it'd be think financially feasible for him at this time to, to absorb that kind of cost. Yeah. On on the fact that they're not running that many markets right now to defray those television costs, uh, and uh, you know cap, you know being undercapitalized is an issue in any business. I'm not saying Victor's undercapitalized, but. You know, I, I think there's probably a demand there uh, for the, the the product, and 
And Victor's got some contacts, uh, too, in that uh, Hispanic television world that have uh, he has uh, worked with in the past. So whatever he succeeds in doing is not going to surprise me. And I, you know, more power to him. I hope that he does because it, it just creates another atmosphere and opportunity for our young talent to work in front of a crowd. Hey, uh, what do you think was the best, the three best calls you ever did of matches? The, th- the three what? The three best calls you ever did of matches. Like, like, the, like I guess he's saying like matches that like you know if you were to go back you know your favorite oh, your favorite matches, performances the, the of yourself you know. Memorable. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, the uh, WrestleMania last year when I came back to work was probably going to have to be in there someplace uh, because of the fact that I've seen it about a zillion times and every highlight that could ever be created. Mick Foley's Hell in a Cell in Pittsburgh with The Undertaker. <laughs> and probably a match that I enjoyed doing about as much as any would be a, a close, uh, would be a toss up between Flair and Steamboat or Flair and uh, Terry Funk somewhere around the late 80s. Uh, both those were, I thought, were uh, kind of all, all those matches I can pretty well, you know, call again without saying it. I think uh, the 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 uh, Hell in the Cell match probably just because it's been repeated so many times in so many forms has probably become like the most uh, memorable call. You know, but for years I would have said like some of those Flair Steamboat matches from '89, but um, boy, I mean, I've seen that that footage, you know, and and your call of it in so many forms for the last you know year and a half. It's it's unbelievable. It's almost that match is one of these weird ones where it's, it's. I think it's bigger now than it really was almost when it when it took place. Yeah. Well, nobody's ever going to forget the bump, obviously. And whenever you have the bump stuck in your mind, you know you can't you can't forget your call either of the bump. Yeah. Well, that was yes. a well, that was a uh, an unbelievable, unbelievable uh, move. You know, I, I still to this day, am, I shake my head in, in amazement, and I I love Mick. You know, I, I really truly do. Uh, he's a wonderful man. I would. I hope to God he never ever even remotely thinks about doing anything close to like that again. But you know, uh, he, he's just uh, he's amazing. You know, he's a he's an amazing guy, and um, I don't know that I'll ever forget that day. I assume you were aware of those bumps before they took place, or were you not filled no, in? No, I wasn't aware that. Uh, I knew that he was going to do something extraordinary, but you know that didn't surprise him because it was him in a main event or co-main event in a pay-per-view. And if you look back at all the main events that Nick Foley was in uh, in the last year or so with our company, uh, he has never failed to deliver. Uh, and I thought that his match with Shawn Michaels in Philadelphia uh, that September, what, a couple of years ago, yeah, I thought was one, one of the My best matches that I'd seen in a long, long time. Those two guys told, told a great story, and it was it was tremendous. A lot of false finishes, and, and it was very well performed, I thought. Uh, but you look back at his track record, and he just always delivered. So when somebody said, well, you know, you know Mick's probably going to do something extraordinary tonight, and I said, yeah, I'm sure, you, I'm sure he will. Because I really didn't want to know for a couple of reasons. I didn't want to worry about it, which is a selfish reason. Uh, the other reason from a professional standpoint is that I tend to do better work if I don't know everything that uh, every little I dotted and every T crossed. So obviously I know the big picture. Yeah, you're not, you know, I'm not uh, trying to sell that bill of goods. I'm, I don't know what's going on, but I, I, I'd rather not know every little, every minute detail. And certainly that spot was not minute, but it was a spot that uh, I was not informed of. So when it happened, uh, it it happened uh, without me thinking about it happening. It, it happened, and whatever I said was a natural, real, bona fide reaction. What's the status as far as uh, the sponsorship and SmackDown, as far as the companies that have pulled out? Are there others that have come back? Um, are they just kind of waiting it out to come back, or or is that kind of a dead issue now? I think it's really a dead issue right now. It's not. It has not been a topic of any uh, uh, discussion in, in upper-level management meetings that I've been involved in. I think it's uh, really the uh, – we've kind of weathered the storm on that in, in the way I see it, you know uh, – I know that Burger King, as most folks know, came back after a week, and uh, they're having problems with inventory in the first quarter uh, 
as far as uh, accommodating the uh, demand for commercial time. So I know business is very good, thank goodness. But, uh, you know, I think the thing really has kind of blown over, and it, it, quite frankly and honestly, it isn't a, a major issue uh, in our office. Uh, it hasn't been for several weeks. Now, it's pretty, been pretty obvious in the last month or so. Um, SmackDown is toned down. I don't think that there's really been any noticeable effect, you know, one way or the other on the ratings. Uh, you know, the women wearing slightly more clothes. I noticed, and I don't know if this was a conscious effort or just how the show turned out. I mean, I just noticed from watching Raw on Monday, it seemed more toned down than previous weeks. And is that like a, a company thing, or is just is this happened to be how that show turned out? I think it's as much as it happened to be how that show turned out as any conscious effort. Uh, uh, there are certain things that we 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 have. Uh, Evaluated, and uh, you know, I just think that we're going to probably take the try to take the higher road uh, uh, more often than not. Not that we're always going to, you know, hit that mark, uh, but you know, I don't think that there was any, uh, you know, we had we, we certainly didn't have any uh, any powwow or any huddle to determine, you know, we're going to do this on Raw tonight, we're going to tone it back or back down on it or something. I think it basically the function of how the show was written, but I do think that you're going to see us uh, uh, take the high road. Uh, more often than not, on a lot of the things we do and a lot of the things we say, and certainly that isn't to say that it, uh, we aren't going to try to maintain an edge and still do some provocative television. I just think we're going to be able. I think we're going to be able to do better. I think we're getting better at what we do, and hopefully we're going to be able to refine what we do and uh, still keep the, the product entertaining for all of our demographics, especially the ones that uh, uh, seem to be the most responsive, and that's the. The you know males eighteen to thirty four essentially. Are there any are there any characters whether it be you know an Edge or a Christian or or people like or the Hardy Boys or or whatever that you're kind of looking at trying to really elevate and you know move to that top level like who do you see as far as like you've got your upper echelon with you know with um, fully bowing out you know fairly soon I guess you know later in the year so it's it's Austin if he's healthy obviously Hunter and Rock is the the prime guys. Are there any guys that you see right underneath there that uh, maybe would have pay-per-view main events maybe towards the, the summer or the fall next year? Well, certainly uh, The Undertaker's going to be back. Sure. And, uh, you know, he fits in that upper echelon on group, obviously. Uh, is, 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 are you still looking at probably Royal Rumble, or is is that, you know, evaluation changed? Well, he's he's doing better. Uh, he's You know, he's still uh, training, and uh, uh, he seems to be in... in uh, Seems to be getting a lot better, and uh, his spirits are great, and the attitude's wonderful. And I think we miss his leadership. Not that we haven't had good leadership, but you know you can't have too much. He's such a steadying influence in our locker room, and uh, we miss his presence uh, in that respect as well as in front of the camera. But I think uh, right now our plans are that he will hopefully be available to us at the Royal Rumble. And uh, we're going on that premise uh, unless, you know, his growing is just not going to get it done. So uh, that's a game plan right now. I think we've got a lot of guys that have the ability, if the right story, if they got the right story, got, got enough exposure, got the opportunity to, 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 uh, to talk and verbalize on television a little bit more. I, I think Edge is certainly uh, a kid that we have a great deal of confidence in. You know, I think Val Venus uh, has a wealth of potential, personally. Uh, I think Prince Albert has uh, a lot of potential. I think we'll see him doing some upward movement. Um, you know, there's D'Lo Brown. Is, uh, uh, in my view, I would kind of he's like a, a puzzle that is a picture, a picture puzzle that is, has a missing piece. And the piece is not his work ethic or his... his uh, uh, anything with, with him other than us getting him into a, a good story uh, and him being able to execute it. And uh, so he's very close in the taking a step up, in my view. I think, like I said, I think Edge has got lots of potential, a great upside for him. Uh, but so does so does Christian. And, and certainly the Hardy Boys are extremely innovative and uh, they just have a huge upside. I mean, it's inevitable to me that all those guys I mentioned, whether it be in the next six months or the following six months, but soon in their careers, 
I'm going to have the opportunity to uh, be given the opportunity to go to the next level. And I, th- I don't have any doubts that some of them are not going to stick and become big stars. Now, as far as Jimbo Brown goes, is, is his contract situation totally worked out? Is there what, what's you know there have been a lot of rumors about him the last two three months? He's got probably uh, about I'm going to guess about 14 or 16 months left on this contract, uh, and he is uh, he and I have uh, begun uh, uh, discussions on a new deal. That our goal is to have it done long before he has even one year left. Uh, we think that he's, uh, you know, earned a, a new contract, and and we have great uh, we have great uh, hopes for D'Lo. He's he is the kind of kid that we we like to uh, do business with. You know, he's he's intelligent and he has a lot of integrity and he has a lot of class. If you give me his notice today, I'd say the same thing. He's a I met him in, uh, when I was doing some stuff for Cornette down in Smoky Mountain. I know how badly he wants to be in the business, how badly he worked to get here, and, and how much he, weight he lost, and, and, and the constant fight he has on working on his conditioning and his look and all those things. Uh, he's really got a great heart and a great attitude, and, and we're going to do all we can to keep him. And I feel confident and comfortable that we will. Uh, he wants to stay here, and so uh, and we want him, and we want him to stay here. So we both have the the main goals. In common, it's just a matter now coming to terms on the dollar side, and, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't have something done on on his contract uh, within the next couple of weeks. Let's go to Western Virginia. Wes, what's going on? Hi, guys. Uh, Jim, I wanted to ask you, in light of the McMahons being so involved on the Raw show, and also with Mick Foley and Steve Austin not appearing, how do you uh, expect the house show business to go in the future of the WWF? Well, I expect that those guys we just talked about uh, to step up to the plate and continue to grow as performers. Uh, you know, the outlaw, the whole DX group, uh, the outlaws, and, and uh, X Pac and, and Triple H are all young and, and they all like to perform and they're very, very valuable in our house shows. I, I feel good about the fact that they're going to be on our house shows. Uh, Kane is is uh, continuing to. In, in my view, to move upwardly, uh, he's a great attraction in the house shows. His reaction, his response to house shows is great. Uh, we want to continue to see uh, improvement in uh, Big Show, and we've been real happy with what, we've, what he has done uh, uh, in the last uh, several weeks specifically. Uh, so we, we believe that the house show business is going to remain uh, competitive and good for us. Uh, I think that... The one thing that we do is that we really uh, we motivate the talent, which is not hard to do with this group, who perform at a high level in the house shows. Uh, we are, you know, we're doing our best to to have uh, finishes more often, much, much more often than not. Uh, we're trying our best not to bait and switch and false advertise. Um, you know, we've really, I think, we've done a good job in in in, in the the results of the live events and hopefully that will help bring people back the next time uh, but you know I, I feel comfortable that this roster that we have in place is, is going to still be strong and obviously we would love to have Austin back and we need to undertake her back and I mean no doubt about that uh, but you know knock on wood as long as the rock is healthy and, and the big show and Kane and you know we'll get a little bit more mileage out of old Mick while we're elevating some other folks Chris Jericho is going to be a huge addition on that side too, uh, I feel real comfortable that our, our house show business is going to remain strong. I think one of the strong points of you guys' house show business is the fact that the shows are packed with all the big names, and the production of the shows is also the same sort of production that you'd almost get if you went to a TV taping. Because as long as you have like a couple of big names up there on the top, most fans, at least like around here when the WWF is coming, aren't as excited to see like who's wrestling who in the matchups. But just the fact that the big show is coming to this area and there's going to be the production, there's going to be the big names on top, and as long as that stays strong, I think business will be good. I mean, even if there are top names that are on the shelf, this has been the case for like the past couple of months now. Yeah, and I think it's important for us to uh, to provide a good show. You know, I think Dave uh, uh, wrote some stuff about the, the show that he saw in person in San Jose, which was a, a house show, and, and I'd like to think that that house show was indicative of the house shows that we do much more often than not, and hopefully by the performance of the guys that night and the effort they put forth, that 
those, those folks that were there buying tickets will not have a problem uh, investing in, in our product again the next time we're in that marketplace. And for San Jose's sake, uh, uh, situation rather, uh, they responded very well because our our next date there, which is, happens to be a raw, sold out in, in a pretty quick fashion. Uh, we've got this a couple. A lot of people have actually been asking this one. Um, is there anything, as far as you know, as far as the status of of Ric Flair? And I guess this question here says, if he got out of his contract, would you be interested in him? Which I think is a almost a redundant question. But uh, what, what is this? Do you know anything new on the status of Ric Flair? No, I, I really don't know anything new on Ric's status. You know, other than he's still under contract to WCW. Uh, you know, Rick is uh, um, a, a great treasure in our business. And uh, has a lot to offer, and uh, he is—he's uh, idolized by a lot of guys in uh, in our locker room. There's no doubt about that, and I think he's very well respected. I know that he's extremely well respected in our front office, including uh, the owner of this company. So, you know, I don't know what uh, Rick's future holds, but I wouldn't think that Rick would be sitting on the sidelines too long if. Uh, uh, you know, if he were if he were available, but uh, you know, past that, uh, I think any company, whether it be in wrestling or anywhere else, would be uh, lucky to have have Ric Flair involved with them. Let's uh, before actually before we go to the next call, I just want to ask. Uh, also, this is another question a lot of people have been asking for the last couple of weeks. Is there any start date for Taz? About how many weeks, or imminently, or or what's the status of him? Well, our agreement with Paul Lee was that we'd start Taz sometime after the first of the year and give Paul the opportunity to use Taz uh, as as much as uh, as he needed in the last uh, quarter of the year. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can start Taz any time. And I think, basically speaking, uh, it's a matter of uh, the fact that we all have uh, high hopes for Taz. And we want to give Taz the very best opportunity that he, that he can get uh, to have a good debut and to have a good have, to have a very auspicious start. Uh, and with that said, the creative needs to reflect that that feeling. And I don't think that there is the creative yet that we have discussed has anyone uh, uh, comfortable. Uh, uh, yet, I think I think we're still looking for the, exactly the right idea, and I'm not. It's no layup that he's even going to be in the Royal Rumble, uh, but he might be. I mean, I'm not I'm not being evasive. I guess I am, and but I'm not intensely being evasive. I think it depends on uh, the creative direction. We have a lot of hopes, high hopes for him, and we want to make sure that we don't uh, fumble and get started. And so I think that uh, that's a good thing for Taz. Uh, you know, the better debut. You only get, you know, the old cliche. You only get one chance to make a first impression, and and uh, we'd like to be able to get him started off with a bang. And I don't, and we don't know for, that the Royal Rumble is a place for that to happen. It might be, but but right now it it, it, it hasn't been confirmed. Taking at the debut, do you guys have any idea about where you're planning on going other than that? No, I I think there's a whole lot of talk about that, and, and really, if if we do vignettes on him, uh, it'll all depend on how those vignettes are produced, uh, as to how he's going to be perceived. Uh, if we do some preconditioning in that sense, uh, if I think that the first time fans see him in certain areas, he's going to be a fan favorite. Uh, but I might be wrong there. You know, I'm wrong plenty of times. That's my gut reaction to it because he is new. And in some areas, he has, uh, you know, a real good name identity. You know, he may not get the reaction in San Antonio that he would get in uh, in Worcester or in MSG or something. So uh, I, I think he's going to be a babyface, but I may be wrong. Uh, but a lot of it depends on if we do vignettes, how they would be written and produced and executed by by, by Taz. Is it? Uh, would you be looking at him um, more of a as, of, as, of a gimmick similar to his his gimmick with uh, with Paul, as far as like you know, kind of serious wrestler or? I think so. A... I think I don't think we're gonna. Uh, Paul did a great job, and so did Taz, in creating that persona in ECW. 
and uh, it was some of Paul's best work, and and the talent responded well and took it took it on uh, even farther. Uh, but I think that you know, for those that know Taz, he's a pretty intense guy. You know, he's pretty uh, introspective. He's a very analytical guy. He's always thinking, and he he's not a happy-go-lucky uh, individual. Uh, he's a very serious, you know, guy. And I don't think he can make him anything other than basically than what he is. I think that's a huge trend in what we're doing is trying to package talents so far 180 degrees from what they truly are. And I think the audience nowadays is so intelligent and so educated that they see right through it. And those characterizations, as a rule, in my view, uh, don't make it over the long haul. How many years you go back in wrestling, Jim? Well over 25 years, right? Yep, yeah, longer than I can remember. I just had my 48th birthday on Monday. And, uh, yeah, in fact, we, we've had several people uh, emailed in uh, belated happy birthday to you. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> don't send cash. Uh, uh, but no, I, I, uh, been, it's been about that long. It's hard to believe. But it, in a way, it doesn't seem like it's been that long at all. Because I think I've always, you know, I've been a fan since I was a little kid. And uh, it's like I turn the TV on and, and turn the channel. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of zoomed by. It's like I can't hardly believe I've been in this, been in this long. We've got, we've got a, a full bank of callers and a ton of emails. Let's just go to uh, Dave in Arizona first. Dave, you're up with Jim Ross. And two extremely quick questions. Uh, first, uh, if you could add two guys from w WCW and ECW to the WWF, uh, who would that be? And also, like, how often do you and Vince McMahon, like, examine the, like, WCW for talent? Because obviously you had to have seen Chris Jericho and WCW and the Giants. Dave, you're going to have to help me. Uh, I could barely hear the, the caller. On, on okay, he, he was wondering if you could pick, like, two guys off of the WCW or ECW roster. Uh, who would they be? And also, uh, how much do you watch uh, WCW and uh, ECW television? He was just mentioning how, obviously, you must watch some of it because you'd seen uh, Jericho and the Giant there. Uh -huh. uh, so. Well, I mean, uh, ECW's got uh, uh, some... You know, some interesting talent, and Paul does more with less than just about anybody I've ever known. It's less, and I don't mean character, but, you know, he didn't have a lot of resources over there, and he's put out a pretty damn good product. Uh, you know, I, I like, uh, there's a lot of things about, about Raven that I like, and there's some things about Raven that, that, that trouble me, uh, but I think that he's got a, a, a brilliant mind. I really and truly do. He's very gifted. And I uh, personally like uh, Scotty a lot. I uh, worked with him here at WWF. I think he's has a real good heart. I really and truly do. Uh, so he'd be a kid that I certainly uh, would like working with again at some point in his career, whether it be in front of the camera or behind the camera. Uh, in, in, in WCW, you know, I've always been a big fan of Chris Benoit's work. Uh, I love his work ethic. I love his approach to the game and the business. Uh, and what he gives the fans night after night and what he wants to give. I think he's a great talent. Uh, you know, and I've, certainly uh, Bill Goldberg has uh, so much untapped um, potential that, uh, you know, he'd be, he and Ben Wall would be the two guys that I would, uh, you know, could, could, certainly, could certainly have fun uh, looking on a house show someday. Uh, and as far as watching the other shows, you know, I, I try to watch – uh, ECW uh, on Friday nights. Um, I don't watch their syndicated show as much. It comes on at 1 a.m. and you know an old timer like me is usually in bed by then. Uh, and and WCW, I don't watch it as much. I watch it on tape uh, because on Mondays I'm working. Uh, I guess they're going to move uh, a Thunder to Wednesday if they haven't already. Yeah, it starts uh, this coming Wednesday will be the first time. So, you know, I may be able to check that out then. Uh, but other than that, it was like catching a tape when somebody have a tape uh, in the office of a show uh, and try to see what's going on. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I, we don't, I don't watch the, the competitors as much probably as I should. And that's not because of, I'd like to think, not because of arrogance, but just because of time restraints. Okay, let's go to Derek in Miami. Derek, what's going on? Yeah, hi. I was just wondering uh, how you guys felt about Rakishi Fatu and the response that he got. Oh, yeah, he got a hell of a response the other night. Uh, yeah, on SmackDown. 
On SmackDown, yeah. Yeah, we're ecstatic about it. I mean, it's uh, um, we've been thinking and been thinking, and then Vince came up with this concept for uh, for uh, Rakishi, and uh, I think that there were a lot of folks in our company, and I'm not going to exclude yours truly, that rolled their eyes a little bit on this one when they heard the concept and how the guy was going to be dressed because uh, you know, I was in the meetings uh, on that thing from the get-go, uh, and not that I'm trying to take credit for the concept. Uh, it was Vince's idea, but because I'm in charge of talent, I certainly met with the talent and Vince on, over the idea, uh, and I, you know, I just didn't know how well it would translate to the audience, and, and man, it didn't take too long when the music got put with the character, and the character did a little bit of charismatic uh, movement, a little dancing and stuff. It, it was I was pleasantly surprised. I'm very happy. Uh, it gives us another player because his match on SmackDown I thought elevated uh, him a lot. Definitely. I really assume he did. Absolutely. And, did you guys expect uh, to get the reaction credit, he got? It's also yeah. credit to our champion, I think. Uh, you know, you look back on how Hunter had his few weeks ago with Al Snow. Uh, that helped Al, in my view. Uh, I just think that uh, there's a there's you know, you don't dance by yourself, but uh, that was a great thing for our company uh, Thursday night. Both those guys really stepped up, and it really helped Rakishi. Did you uh, did you guys expect it to go over as well as it did? Because it, it it you know the last two, two three minutes of that match were you know it was like a, it was like a, I mean the people took it seriously. I was surprised how well or how much that they were like uh, sitting there you know on on pins and needles for that title change. I thought I. You know, you would you almost would expect, just given uh, that he hasn't had that much high profile experience, that people would, you know, kind of maybe you know say, okay, it's a good match, but we all know the title's not changing hands, and, it, and the audience reaction certainly didn't indicate that. I think a lot of us just have underestimated how over that character is getting, and 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 uh, uh, you know, that's all I can figure. I mean, I knew that uh, that. Uh, Fatu would, would work hard, and I knew that he knew, because we discussed it with him, the opportunity that he had that night to really uh, turn it on and show people what he could do. And, and uh, I, uh, I, I gave him a huge hug after it was over. That's the only way you can hug him, if you haven't noticed. It's a huge hug. <laughs> uh, I thought he really rose to the occasion. I thought he really, really performed well and worked so hard. And, you know, let's not forget he's 400 pounds. Uh, but he didn't lay on his, on his behind, you know. Uh, he did a real good job. So I was, I was, like I said, pleasantly surprised. And I'm really happy that I just hope that he can keep this momentum going because if he can kiss, keep it pumped up a little bit more, uh, he may surprise us all where he might go. It almost seemed from commentary like you guys are leading towards maybe a program down the road between the two. Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah. Brian just thought that uh, maybe by, by by the commentary, he thought you're almost like uh, leading to a program with those two down the road. Well, I I think that uh, uh, in hindsight, you know, you go into that on the front side, hoping that that's where you can head and create another opponent for the champion to work with. I think when that show was over, we had no doubts in our mind. I certainly didn't that uh, uh, in in the near future, there's a possibility that we could have some main events. In some markets, Rakishi versus Hunter, they might not do badly. I'm not talking yeah. about next week, but I'm talking about, uh, you know, in the not-too-distant future. If Thursday night's reaction is any indication of, uh, as to what we're going to get, say, Monday in St. Louis or, or Tuesday in Chicago. Uh, when I get to uh, this question before uh, we get, go to the next call, um, what's uh, your side of the story as it pertains to Jeff Jarrett and his departure from the World Wrestling Federation? Well, I just, you know, I take responsibility for uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the interruption in the, in the uh, negotiation and uh, the way that was handled. I mean, you know, I'm the one that's in charge of that department, and uh, I'm not going to pass the buck to anybody. Uh, I didn't, I never have from the beginning. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't set up to be uh, somebody printed one time or said uh, I was, uh, you know, the scapegoat. I, I think that I took... I'm taking responsibility because it's my job to get it done. I didn't get that job done. I'd like to thank my track record on recruiting some guys in this roster, and negotiations have been very favorable. Uh, we've won a whole lot more than we've lost. 
Uh, we haven't had too many guys leave our roster that we didn't want to leave to go to go elsewhere. So uh, I think it was uh, certainly the exception to the rule. But uh, I got I, the decision was made late uh, to retain Jeff Services, uh, and he and I started negotiating very late uh, prior to his contract expiring. Once that I was given the green light, and once I was given the green light, I didn't get a deal done. So uh, I accept responsibility of it, and uh, you know I, I wish it had been handled a lot uh, more professionally on both parties' side. Uh, but you know I can't uh, blame anybody but me for because I I had about a month to get a deal done, and I didn't get it handled. And whether or not Russo leaving and going uh, down uh, to Atlanta. Uh, had a, a effect on the negotiations, yay or nay, it's certainly arguable, but uh, that's just me making excuses because the bottom line is I didn't get the, the deal done, and that's my uh, responsibility to do so. Let's go to Joe in Chicago. Joe, what's going on? Um, I'm not sure if this question was already asked, but um, The Rock mentioned in his torch interview that Jericho came in with a lot of heat, and I was wondering why you think that was. It's a lot of... Jericho oh, came, came in with what? He said that Jericho came in. Jericho came in with a lot of heat. Uh, I didn't. I don't. I didn't sense that. I mean, that may be Rock's opinion, and he's certainly welcome to it. Uh, and he looks at it from a different angle than I do, because he's one of the boys, and he's in the locker room, and I'm not. Uh, I didn't get that 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 sense. Uh, but there could have been some uh, trepidation there by some of the talents, uh, you know, because of the value and the hype of Chris coming to our company. I think uh, a lot of that has been uh, uh, erased. Uh, Chris Jericho is a is a fine person, and I, I and I'm not saying that because that's what I'm, I'm paid to do. I, I truly believe that. I think he's a he's an excellent young man. Uh, I think that uh, you know we've all uh, from our front office side uh, to his side, uh, we we've, we've had some stutter steps growing with each other a little bit. But I don't look at that as anything but the, the course of doing business. I think that's just the way things are. Uh, because we had great expectations for him, and we still do. And I think that he's uh, becoming one of our more significant baby faces. His merchandise, his YTJ shirt, is number three or number four selling item of all the items that we have uh, that we're selling. And to me, that uh, tells me that he's, his popularity is genuine if, if the customers are spending money on his, uh, on his merchandise. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, again, my perspective of Chris is, Arrival would be different than Rock's, and I can see Rock's point of view. But in my point of view, uh, I think it was a little bit. Uh, uh, that's that's a little that's a little bit of an overstatement. Joe, you still there? Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Um, quickly, uh, if you could uh, pick one wrestler from outside the states to bring it in and repackage any way you see fit, who would it be? Are you still giving uh, a foreign wrestler? A foreign wrestler. Well, I'll probably have to call Dave and get some suggestions on some good Japanese talent. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who would be out there, Dave. But on a four, I mean, there's a lot of great. Uh, uh, you know, I'd love to have. Uh, 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 what's the uh, the kid that I've talked about before? That's the, the champion over at New Japan. Uh, that kind of remind you know I talked about him before, Dave. Kind of reminds me of Saito in his younger days. Is it uh, Hashimoto yeah. or Shono? Yeah, Hashimoto. Yeah, I, I really, I, I really like him, but I'm, I'm kind of a mark for those, those kind of guys. Yeah, really tough, uh, hard kicks and all that. Yeah, well, I think he's very, very believable style. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah. Um, what's this thing? We have a, a question here: Is uh, what's the status as far as uh, Deborah McMichael? And by the way, did they, did they get married yet? Or did no, they, no, no, they're not married. And Deborah's basically her, uh, you know, her her situation is much like Steve's. Uh, you know, she's kind of off right now until uh, she's making some personal appearances, doing some things of that nature. But uh, we're, she's uh, essentially spending her time with Steve, and, and uh, when uh, we get a better sense of where we're headed with him after the surgery, I'm sure that her uh, storyline will be addressed as well. Uh, so uh, you know, she's kind of on the back burner until after the surgery, and, and we get a little farther down the road. Um, another thing, we actually have to start wrapping this thing up, but uh, a lot of a lot of email questions uh, regarding uh, Jericho, who we just talked about. Um, is there any plans to uh, elevate him to 
you know, where he'd be working with uh, more higher echelon people. I think, um, I don't know, to me, the China thing is sort of like, it's it's just like at best he's stagnant and at worst it's I think it's it hurts him because you know there's just a certain the man versus woman thing I think to in my opinion because it's done so much it's it's been done to death mm-hmm. no, you know a lot on their side too that's an arguable point of view I think uh, but to answer your question directly yes we have uh, we have a, we have a lot of plans to to elevate Chris uh, to the to another level and and we fully expect and are counting on him. To work with those upper echelon guys uh, in in the uh, in the very near future, I mean it's going to be much sooner than later that he's going to be uh, up on those cards. Uh, you know, it's just a, it's a, to me it's just a matter of time because we have every hope and every plan uh, that he's going to be a, a featured uh, performer. And and I, and I don't know why I don't know what would, would keep him from that, quite frankly. We have to uh, wrap this up, and I want to apologize to everyone who sent in emails because we just didn't have the time to get to all of them. And uh, we would certainly love to have uh, Jim back uh, anytime. Uh, I know he's got a, a really busy schedule going on the road every week uh, to do uh, TV Monday and Tuesday, and then having to do his his job, you know, and his front office work as well. So, uh, Jim, I want to thank you very much uh, for coming here uh, while you were a little under the weather, and uh, good luck, uh, good luck at TV Monday and Tuesday. I think uh, I think we'll have. I hope we have good TV. So hope everybody will stay tuned, and and uh, it should be an interesting year. But I, I appreciate uh, all the feedback and. And all the things the fans do for us, and and uh, I think we can never uh, thank them enough for not only participating on this show, but uh, watching our product and buying our pay-per-views, and and uh, helping uh, me fund my daughter's uh, uh, master's program. You ever think it was going to be this big? No. Yeah, no. I. I like to be a, some visionary, so yes. But I think Vince did. I think Vince, quite frankly, uh, saw this in his head all along. Uh, I didn't have that vision. I think Cowboy had a vision comparable to Vince's at one point, but I don't think anybody ever saw what Vince saw as far as what the business would go as far as a public company and things of this nature. Um, you know, the marketing, you know, like with a best-selling book and, a, you know, a top ten record and, you know, just there's so many things that have been going on in wrestling in the last, you know, governor in the last year and a half. Yeah, it's amazing. It's just, it, it really is amazing. It's, and Rock's book is, I think, not this weekend, but next weekend will be in the New York Times uh, top ten bestseller list. If mixed books should still probably be there as well. Uh, that'll, that'll be an interesting uh, top ten list in a couple yeah. of weeks. And I guess the Rock book is just uh, as well as Mick book sold and is selling. Uh, the Rock's book uh, in the early stages is even exceeding that. So it's, wow. it's been an amazing, amazing ride. And I, it, we just raised the bar. You know, we've got a really. Uh, we got to really start doing things. Uh, we got to continue to get, do better at the things we do, and uh, Jim, ho- hopefully we will. Okay, Jim, we're totally out of time. Thanks, Brian. Brian, we'll be talking to you again on Monday, and we'll see everybody Monday. Jim, how you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? Hey. We're doing really good, Jim. This is uh, Brian Alvarez. He does Figure Four Weekly, and uh, we've got. I don't know if you've heard this, but we have more fax questions or email questions than any guest that we have ever had by far. And we had, you know, we had a lot from Ric Flair too. But this is, I got like a like a week's worth of emails right in front of me. Um, and also, you can call up on this line at one eight seven seven three nine two thirty two hundred for Jim Ross. We'd want to keep the callers quick because we expect to get a lot of calls today. Just, Jim, how's the week been going? Uh, good, you know, busy as usual, but uh, doing well. I think, uh, like, not unlike anybody, uh, a lot of other folks, I'm trying to personally uh, combat the flu I've had for a couple of weeks. Uh, so much for the concept of getting a flu shot early. But other than that, things are things are good. You know, uh, on the personal side, things are good. My my oldest daughter just got accepted to graduate school, and you know, I think that's a pretty cool accomplishment for her. And uh, she has uh, worked very hard to be a good student. It hasn't come real easily for her, so she's worked very diligently and going to continue to. Get educated, which I think is a good thing. Are there a lot of guys, uh, you know, was battling the flu right now in the company? Because I know in the Northeast it just seems like, uh, from what I hear, it's it's like it's almost epidemic. We have uh, a, a lot of our talent are have, have a variety of ailments, and the flu certainly seems to have affected uh, more than its share on our roster. I think uh, it's really uh, seemingly taken its toll on a lot of the folks who work up here in the office because, like you said, the Northeast seems to be has been hit uh, especially hard, so uh, but we're working through it. You know, uh, just you can keep on going. So, is there uh, anyone? Uh, is there anyone who's going to be missing this weekend because of uh, injuries or illness or anything? 
Uh, we're going to let D.O. Brown have a couple more days off to get over his uh, shoulder injury. Uh, uh, as a precautionary thing, he could work this weekend. We think it would be uh, better for him and certainly uh, in the long run to let that, his shoulder heal another couple of days. And uh, he'll be back uh, Monday if needed for uh, for Raw. But D.O. will not make the house shows this weekend. Uh, Bulldog was originally booked on these cards. Uh, I talked to some folks in Calgary today. He'll be clear to come back to work uh, as it stands right now on uh, January the 17th, which would be the Raw in New Haven. So he will not be on the cards this week. We're going to have Jim Ross on the line in just a couple of minutes, and we'll start taking uh, phone calls. We'll go through as many emails as we can. We probably have enough emails to go through about three shows, I think, for Jim Ross. Uh, Brian, um I was going to ask you a question here. This, this um, I spent like all day the last couple of days like uh, figuring out like awards and things like that. And next Friday, which we don't have a guest next Friday, uh, we should do the award show. We'll go through all the Wrestling Observer awards. So we'll do that a week from today. But um, this will give away the result of one of the awards, I guess. Um, it is the first time in history that the winner of the Rookie of the Year award was fired by the company before the year was over. Oh, no. So anyway. Yeah, can you believe that? How about that? How about that? Not only that, he probably had the best match you've seen in how many years in your right live? Live? Yeah. Uh, maybe ever. <laughs> oh my God, Brian, what else is what? Else, I've been I've been like, uh, let's see, what else has been going on? Anything else big going on today? Well, there was a big article in the newspaper about Steve Austin getting his surgery moved to January 17th. It'll be at the Methodist Hospital in San Antonio with Dr. Lloyd Youngblood, and apparently it was a case of the hospital being closer to his house, and he didn't want to have to fly all the way out to Dr. Bullman to get checkups and everything like that, and um, I would assume, you know, after the surgery was over, trying to get back to San Antonio and that sort of thing, so anyway, it has been moved, it'll be January 17th, and I believe there was also a quote from Dr. Bullman wondering why Austin had changed the date of the surgery since he was the man who invented the procedure. That's it's that's really interesting because you know uh, Dr. Bowman had come so heavily recommended by Dr. Torg, and uh, the procedure you know um, like he invented the procedure and he was the one you know the whole thing is is you know he wanted to get back like Cal Ripken anyway when Jim Ross is here we'll uh, we should talk to him about that one uh, that's uh, kind of an interesting thing I, I had heard about I had I had heard that report and also uh, yesterday actually uh, speaking of the San Antonio area Cameron Cade Hickenbottom was born. John Michael's son. So. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Now get him back to work. Yeah. Okay. He was born yesterday. I did not. That one I didn't hear. Oh. What? What? Uh. Anything else going on? We can uh, start hitting emails before we. Get Actually, here's one to ask Jim Ross because it, it was in his Ross report that just came out today. Oh, the, the Terry Funk thing. Oh, that's we can. Uh, hopefully, if we've done our job, he would have been removed from the advertising earlier. Uh, but in any event, uh, he will not be on the card this weekend. I can't think of anybody else off the top of my head. You know, talking to you guys might jar my memory, but uh, I heard Rodney might have hurt his shoulder at the SmackDown tapings. Rodney, Rodney dinged his shoulder a little bit. He did, uh, and uh, even though Rodney's not booked on the house show tour this weekend, uh, he's going to uh, has trained through that injury, from what I understand. And uh, according to our, I have a guy by the name of Bob Clark who works for us in uh, talent relations. That is uh, one of his jobs is to be the point man on all the injuries and the rehab and stuff. And he's been staying pretty busy on that project. And he told me today that Rodney's uh, so shoulder was sore, but he'd be ready to go on Monday. What about um, um, Ken Shamrock and Mark Henry? Well, Ken Shamrock, interesting thing there. Uh, Kenny was cleared from his neck condition to come back to work probably two or three weeks ago. Uh, and then about... A week ago, uh, we heard on the Internet that he had knee surgery, which was news to us. Uh, we called him, and he d flatly denied that he had not had the surgery. Uh, then, subsequently to that, uh, Vince and I met with uh, Ken in, in Stanford about a week or so ago. Uh, he looked great and declared to come back to work and, you know, great frame of mind and looked well-rested and so forth. And uh, Then I talked to Barry Bloom today, uh, Ken's agent, about some other issues, and uh, he mentioned to me that Kenny had had his knee scoped this week uh, on a little minor thing, according to uh, uh, Barry. So uh, just some, I guess, some loose particles that they made a small incision and got out of there. Not a big deal at all, from what I understand, and uh, probably uh, maybe a week's worth of uh, therapy to get him 
you know, for the, to work the soreness out. Not a major thing at all. But uh, Mark Henry has got a slight uh, ligament tear in his elbow that uh, we're trying to rehab through and not go the surger, surgical route. And Mark uh, hopefully will be back uh, in time for some participation from the physical level at the Royal Rumble. Now, what about uh, we, I guess, heard a report that Austin is uh, switched to surgery to San Antonio January 17th. Uh, what do you know about that? Well, Steve uh, had uh, consulted a doctor down in uh, San Antonio. And a father match, we just kept taking him down over and over again? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, but what's funny is he would take him down, okay, and then every time he took him down, Godfather would, like, go to the guard, okay? But in wrestling, like, in theory, okay, if you're in, you know, it was supposed to be wrestling takedowns, and judges wrestling takedowns. And what would happen is Severin would take the guy down, and then Godfather would go to the guard. Now, when you're in the guard, in a martial arts sense, it's considered a neutral position, but in a wrestling sense, you're on your back getting pinned, but pins didn't count. Yeah. But it, but it was takedowns, and I just remember, like, uh, Jerry Lawler going, well, that's not a takedown. And, like, he would just take him down, and then Jerry Lawler would go, well, that's not, I don't consider that a takedown. And I was just thinking, like, you know, thank God that they have Danny Hodge scoring this, because this announcer is calling this match. You know, I, Jerry Lawler um, it was pretty much exposed that he had never actually watched wrestling in his life. Uh. And and uh, because he kept saying how Dan Severn never scored any takedowns. when All he did was keep taking the guy down. But I think that the theory behind it, perhaps, um, was one of two things. Either, one, they didn't really think about it a lot, or, B... The feeling was that uh, Dan Severin, um, that, that Steve Williams would be a good enough wrestler that Dan Severin wouldn't be able to take him down, and that if the match remained on its feet, that Steve Williams would probably be better standing than Dan Severin. And so maybe maybe that was the theory behind it. But um, Well, that's the only theory that makes sense other than that they weren't thinking. Yeah. So, anyway, actually, let's throw that one in the list of questions to ask. Too. Ask Ross. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Joe Rivette who says, worst entrance music ever, Steve Regal's Man's Man. Now, see, I like that one. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> yeah. That was a classic. Yeah, that one was just too good. Uh, let's see, uh, let's go to one more because we've got Jim Ross on the line. Uh, let me see, this is, um, uh, da, 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 da. why doesn't WC, this is from Alfredo, Alfredo Esparza, he goes, why doesn't WCW take Nitro? I'm serious. Watch Nitro and Thunder at the same time, and it looks like night and day. Well, the last couple of weeks it has, hasn't it? Hey, I got a question for you. Yeah. Why couldn't they have taped Canyon hitting Bigelow with a barbecue or his uh, champagne bottle at Nitro instead of flying him all the way in for 13 seconds? Because um, I, I think they weren't thinking that far ahead. Let's ask you know, like, about I, that one, too. Uh, Jim, it's like, yeah, it's Jim Ross about things in WCW like that. You You'd know? have a good answer, though. He probably will. Let's get him on the line. Classic. Yeah, Very we... Uh, still under contract to the World Wrestling Federation. Yeah, we've gotten like uh, 400 emails on that one, so we'll talk... Actually, that'll be like one of the first questions we talk to him about uh, when we get him on. Also, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, I believe, today did a story that's actually... It actually was... The first I read was in the Pro Wrestling Torch about uh, a week ago about the WWS television contracts revolving uh, UPN and... Uh, and also a USA Network, and we we'll want to get uh, want to get some comments on that as well, because uh, I don't know, just kind of interesting. Uh, you, you know, SmackDown is generally credited in the media for um, saving UPN from basically out of ex going out of extinction, being buried under a sea of incredible red ink. And if that was the case, and UPN had had you know given the WF this network deal and everything like that, wouldn't you think they would retain an option to not lose it if the show was a hit? I would think I mean, that. I don't know. I don't know. I would just think that. So, anyway, it's something that... Maybe they were so desperate they just gave the WWF anything they wanted. Um, perhaps. Perhaps. That's, that's really interesting, though. Anyway, let's get to some emails for the next few minutes. This is from Andrew Martelli, who said that you mentioned that Vader is the best worker of over 300 pounds. That's true, but I think a close second goes to Glenn Jacobs. Um, after all his cheesy gimmicks, he only found the right one, but now the WF's killing his gimmick. Okay. I think Kane has improved a lot. I mean, really, and he's, his matches are, are a lot better than they were a year ago. But uh, I don't know if it's close second between Kane and Bruiser Brody. I don't think he's in that league, personally. Uh, this is from Ben Lid. Um, if the brawl for all was to set up Steve Williams to walk away, then how can you explain Dan Severn being in the tournament? Um, I don't know. How would you explain that one? I don't think that... Well, that's a good question, actually, because... It's a real good question, isn't it? Maybe they, because you know, Dan Severn, of course, would just take everybody down, and takedowns were what, like five points or something? 
Yeah, I, I think that the feeling probably was, because, uh, you know, originally they didn't want uh, Dan Severn or Ken Shamrock in it, okay? Then about a week or two in, some of the guys started dropping out. I'm not sure exactly what went down. And then um, they asked Shamrock and Severn to do it, and Shamrock said no. He didn't want to just go in there with no training, you know, and do a shoot. And Severn said yes. And then Severn did one match with the Godfather where he took him down, which was Actually, that match was like hilarious. You remember that match, Brian? Don't you? I the Dan Severn. That match. The Dan Severn 